Meanwhile, in Ti Yang Sing City, people gather in the inner palace, eager to pay their respects to the Lin ancestor. However, hours have passed and the ceremony is yet to begin, leading some people to speculate that the ancestor didn't cultivate with proper techniques and has failed to make it to the real world. Just then, Zhen Nun walks through the doors, carrying a baby, surprising everyone who expected the Lin ancestor. Speculation then arises about the baby being Zhen Nun's illegitimate child. Geez, even in this world, Karens exist. Finally, when Zhen Nun reaches the stage, he tells the baby that the guests are here, while addressing the baby as father. Nani? He's Benjamin Button? Well, not really. This baby is Lin Chung, the Lin family ancestor. He only looks like a baby because he's at the beginning stage of the body recombining realm. Lin Chung informs Zhen Nun to begin the feast and that everyone should pay their respects to his ancestor. However, many people find it awkward to pay their respects to a child. Because come on, offended. Lin Chung unleashes his terrifying aura, which successfully makes everyone comply with their purpose. Horrified, they start praising Lin Chung while showering him with gifts. Meanwhile, Bai Luo Chun, Duo Duo, and Li Yue remain seated at their table while everyone cowers over Lin Chun. Duo Duo suggests that they join the others to pay their respects, but Bai sees nothing wrong with what they're doing. Li Yue can only smirk, claiming that Lin Chung is acting too cocky just because he reached the body recombining stage. However, Bai Luo Chun corrects her, saying that even across the realm, there are only a few hundred body recombining stage cultivators. It's basically like reaching the top of the South Realm, so it's kind of a big deal. Really, while Li Yue and Mi Meng fight over food, as if there isn't an entire buffet. Duo Duo is amazed that Li Chung's aura is entirely different from Bai's. Just then, someone approaches their table, cursing Bai Lu Chun for talking so arrogantly. This man is Yi Zi Un, and he looks rather scrawny if you ask me. As Yi Zi Un keeps dissing Bai Lu Chun, our MC struggles to remember who this walking skeleton is. Furious that he doesn't even remember who he is, Zi Un reminds him that he humiliated him for a woman. As Scrawny here tries to unleash his rage, he suddenly coughs up blood. What a loser. Bai hasn't even lifted a finger yet and he's already dying. Just then, it finally rings a bell. Bai Luo Chun remembers this man. Zi Un claims that Bai was untouchable when he was in the academy, but now that he's not on school grounds, he can finally avenge himself. In that state, yeah, right. Bai, on the other hand, teases Zi Un further by handing him a drumstick. Man's looks like he could use a bite or two. However, Zion whacks the drumstick away, stressing that Bai should stop playing dumb. He then commands Bai to kneel on the floor and raise his Tushi if he doesn't want to die, just like how Bai did to him back then. Li Yue is offended that Zion is speaking to her master like this, considering that he looks like he's one cough away from dying. Zion almost cast a spell on Li Yue, but Bai stops him with his mere chopsticks, telling him to keep the youngsters away from their affairs. Zi Un is enraged, but before he can do anything about it, a messenger informs him that the family head is summoning him into the palace. As Zi Un leaves, Du Oduo can't help but think that there are so many arrogant people in the Lin family. Bai Lu O Chun believes that these lowlife dogs wouldn't growl at them without their master's orders, so it's quite obvious. They're unwanted guests. Suddenly, the system congratulates Bai for unlocking world missions. It also suggests that he must defeat the incoming enemies and spread his name. Sensing that there might be a threat, Bai unleashes a sensory talisman. In the palace, Zi Un expresses his grievances to Lin Chung, claiming that he hasn't been able to break through for three years because of Bai. Zi Un adds that Bai just attacked him out of nowhere and he has caused his body to deteriorate. With this, he pleads that Lin Chung holds justice for him, his disciple. Wow, the audacity of this skeleton. Zun Nun is offended that Zi Un asks this of his ancestor. Lin Shang has accidentally combined his body with his nascent soul, and has yet to get used to his new body. How dare this twig provoke Ching Hong Academy for his private matters? Just then, Lin Shang tells Zun Nun to shut his trap. Well, that's embarrassing. He claims that the challenges he met are not necessarily mistakes. On the bright side, he was able to break through. Thanks to the secret book left behind by Kai Shiyu. She doesn't really have the best handwriting, but it was definitely helpful. I don't know about this guy, but the book is literally titled, Not Reliable Ways to Reach Body Recombining. Lin Chun then adds that he will let Zhen Nun and Zi Un take a look at the very reliable book when they reach the peak of immortalization. Thankful for his kindness, Zhen Nun and Zi Un bow before him, 
Lin Shang then says that Ching Hong Academy means nothing to him at the moment, but Li Gu An Qi might be a problem. Suddenly, the three are disturbed by a loud commotion from outside. Someone is attacking Tian Xing City's grand formation, and it can't hold on for much longer. Just then, a giant serpent emerges from the skies, and it is being controlled by a mysterious cultivator. The serpent continues to dwell in the skies, making the citizens more concerned. The serpent suddenly opens its eyes, releasing a strong wave of pressure upon the civilians. While everyone is losing their heads over this dilemma, Bai Luo Chun and Li Yu Wei continue feasting on their meals. Bai believes that the serpent and its cultivator might break through, but he's more concerned about his meal. Zhao Shiyi, a cultivator who is at the soul separation stage, who also looks rather fruity, has overheard the three's conversation, and he can't help but think about how clueless they are. This colossal formation is the Tian Sing formation, which was set up by a saint-level talisman master. It won't break that easily like Bai thinks. He continues to mumble to himself, vocally expressing how offended he is that the Lin family put him in the same presence as Bai and his lowly disciples. Hearing this, Mimon asks if they're not gonna beat the hell out of this diva. However, Bai and Li Yue are unbothered, knowing that this city is filled to the brim with people like him. Realizing that they've been facing this their whole life, Duo Duo can't help but adore their resilience. Just then, Bai senses that the Tian Sing formation is about to break. True enough, the impossible has happened, leaving everyone in a state of panic. Zhao Shiyi, on the other hand, is horrified about the cultivator controlling the serpent. Impossible. How can this man be back from the dead? It's no other than the green snake young master. The man then jumps off of the serpent, and it gradually becomes smaller. He then walks towards Bai Luo Chun, who's still unimpressed and unbothered. He asks the man why he's staring at him, and he also tells him to find a seat if he wants to join the party. Bai tries to look tough on the outside, but he's actually vigilant. He then notices that Duo Duo is shaking in fear, so he asks her who this mystery man is. Duo Duo explains that 200 years ago, the Green Snake Young Master was a Tribulation Peak evil cultivator from the Longfang Sea region. He caused trouble in the three prefectures around Gu Anling, and all the big sects and families had to collaborate to bring him down. The Nalan family participated in stopping him, but none of them made it back. Whoa, this guy's a tough one. This leaves Bai thinking that the Green Snake must be close to ascending, which might mean that the Lin family is in deep trouble. However, Du Oduo corrects Bai, explaining that the Green Snake is already dead. Hold up, if he's dead, then who's this guy right here? Du Oduo explains that her father told her that the Lin family ancestor killed the Green Snake along with himself. This might suggest that the Green Snake is back for some long overdue revenge. All right, bring out the popcorn. Bai is excited to see the showdown. The Green Snake Young Master makes his way to the palace, letting the Lin family know of his return. He sarcastically announces his congratulations, pairing it with a terrifying display of his powers. Lin Shang is shocked by his presence, as he's supposed to be chopped up by the Lin's 200 years ago. The Green Snake is impressed by how opinionated this baby is, so he praises Zhun Nun for it. Zhun Nun explains that he's not a baby but his father, Lin Chun. Wanting to insult them, the Green Snake doesn't acknowledge this information, but tells Zhun Nun to bring his father out. Cautious about the chaos that is about to ensue, Lin Shang hands a token to Zi Un, telling him to deliver it to the big sex. As Zi Un runs out of the palace, he can't help but freak out about the Green Snake's presence. He must be so powerful that even Lin Chung is scared of him. Just then, Zian gets a big brain moment. If Lin Chung can't help him with his issue at Ching Hong Academy, and he won't punish Bai Luo Chun, then maybe the Green Snake Young Master will. Yes, this seems like a good plan. With this, Zian destroys the token in his hand, determined to seek revenge against Bai Luo Chun. Back at the palace, Bai Luo Chun and the disciples observe the impending doom of the Lin's. Duo Duo worries that they might be detected, but Li Yue reassures her that Bai's stealth skills are too good that even Earth Immortals won't notice. However, Bai reminds her that skill isn't enough if they get caught. Meanwhile, the Green Snake commands Lin Chung to kneel before him. This offends Lin Chung, so he reminds the intruder that the righteous cultivators ended him 200 years ago, and they can do that again. Out of nowhere, Z unappears screaming that Lin Chong is worthless and the green snake is more powerful than him. Furious, Lin Chong almost zaps the life out of this skeleton, but the green snake stops him, saying that he should allow people to finish talking. Zian, the traitor that he is, presents the green snake with a gift, 
a hundred-year-old dragon saliva wood. This was supposed to be a gift for Lin Chun, but he believes the green snake young master's serpent is more worthy of such treasure. The serpent is delighted, and seeing how happy it is, the green snake vows to keep Xi'an safe. To impress his new master further, Xi'an runs off to get some pastries, but Lin Chang reminds him that traitors don't live long. Xi'an spits back, calling him an old fart who will die before him. Wu! Shots fired. Meanwhile, Bai Lu Ochun asks Duo Duo to lend him some of her poison feathers. After combining a few ingredients with the feathers, Bai Lu Ochun blows it towards Xi'an, who immediately feels a strong surge of power within him. He suddenly grows big, like an unstoppable monster. Xi'an believes that the green snake gave him this cultivation power, and he's beyond amazed. You're crediting the wrong person, pal. Xi'an is fired up as he has reached the nascent soul stage. He even boasts that he's way worse than the Lin family's young master. Zun Nun attempts to put down Xi'an, but Lin Sheng stops him, saying that it's not the right time. If they move recklessly, the green snake might bring out a life-threatening attack. Lin Sheng then reveals that he has a backup plan other than letting Xi'an deliver the token. He has people on the way to help. Meanwhile, the green snake insults Lin Chun, saying that the old dog had powerful assets like Xi'an all along, and he didn't even know. However, at the back of the green snake's mind, he can't help but think that Xi'an has some weird power in him, and it resembles his own. Well, might just use this against the Lin family. Meanwhile, Xi'an asks Zhen Nun if he's proud of him for breaking through. After all, he's way stronger than Yuan Ji, who's only good at playing with women's melons. Zun Nun spits back, emphasizing that Xi'an is nothing but a coward who works for evil. And speak of the devil. Yuan Ji busts into the room, half-dressed, confused by the loud sounds from the hall. Xi'an turns his attention to him, sarcastically asking if he interrupted his fun time with the ladies. Zun Nun screams at his son to run for it, but Yuan Ji doesn't listen. Instead, he angrily asks who this giant bloke is, to which Xi'an responds that he's the one who will end his life. Xi'an launches toward Yuan Ji, while Lin Chun forces the green snake to stop this chaos. Zun Nun tries to save his son, despite being bitten by the giant serpent. Meanwhile, Xi'an goes for the kill, but Zhen Nun embraces Yuan Ji to keep him from receiving the blow. This scene amuses the green snake, and he finds this situation quite touching. Unfortunately, Zhen Nun wasn't able to save his son. Enraged, Lin Chun channels all his available power to seek revenge for his family. He claims he doesn't care if he loses all his powers. He vows to kill the green snake on that very day. After transforming into a huge giant, Lin Chun attacks the green snake, but the latter is unfazed, thinking that Lin Chun is overreacting to his grandson's death. To put this overgrown baby in his place, the green snake young master orders his serpent to constrict Lin Chun. He then tells Lin Chun to reflect on his actions, suggesting that everything might be his fault to begin with. Meanwhile, Bai Luo Chun and the disciples decide whether they should help the Lins or not. Despite being rude idiots, the Lins are still a good sect, compared to the green snake who is part of an evil sect. Bai Luo Chun adds that he doesn't want the Lin family to be wiped out, so he ultimately decides to aid them. Oh, Bai, you're too nice. Just then, Bai Luo Chun excuses himself, telling the disciples to keep Zhen Nun alive until he returns. Meanwhile, the green snake earns the upper hand in his battle with Lin Chun. The poor Lin Chun gets pierced in the chest with the serpent's fangs, but he refuses to back down. The green snake then suggests that he begs for his life, so he might be spared. However, Lin Chun refuses, saying that he will never bow down to evil, even at the cost of his life. Suddenly, the green snake removes his mask, attempting to make Lin Chun realize that he's not as righteous as he thinks he is. Brace yourselves, it's time for a plot twist. The green snake unveils that 50 years ago, Lin Chun forced his daughter, Lin Mia Shuan, to marry an old man in exchange for money. On the night of her wedding, she ran away with the green snake young master. But Lin Chun chased them to Thunder Cliff and killed them both. If Lin Chun thinks this is a good deed, then if the green snake kills him now, perhaps it will be a good deed as well. Sheesh. Now that's a sick revenge plot. Finally, Lin Chun remembers. This isn't the green snake, but it's Ji Shunrun, his late daughter's lover. Shunrun reveals that the old Shunrun died with Miya Shuan on that cliff, and now, he's a proud follower of the green master. His serpent, Ching Poer, is about to become a demon lord and turn into a dragon. But first, she must kill the entire Lin family. 
The souls of everyone in Tianxing City will be her fuel. And it is only justified. Lin Chung counters, saying that there are plenty of innocent lives that will be collateral damage for this madness. He then reminds Shun Run to fear karma, but he doesn't care. Shun Run only claims that he's better than the phony good guys who talk nicely, but are evil behind closed doors. Lin Chung realizes that the stakes are now higher than ever, so he hesitates if he should pull this drastic move that could kill him. The overgrown baby says YOLO and does it anyway. With his star shifting technique, Lin Chung breaks the void and attempts to attack Shun Run from behind. However, before he can land a punch, he suddenly coughs out blood. The poison from Ching Po'er's bite is kicking in. To make matters worse, it's no ordinary poison, but soul poison. This reveals that Shun Run has ties with the soul sect, which makes sense. Duh. How else could he get privileges in owning a beast at Ching Po'er's level? Shun Run then lays out his plan. Lin Chang will be Ching Po'er's appetizer, and after that, the entirety of Tiang Sing City. However, before Shun Run can end Lin Chang, he realizes that he's not talking to the old man, but to Bai Luo Chun's puppet. Shun Run finds Bai behind him, who has now contained Ching Po'er and his grasp. Before Shun Run could react, Bai Lu O Chun opened up a domain. Shun Run is amazed that he can create a domain used by Earth Immortals, but Bai replies that it's just a simple one. Shun Run wonders how the Lins hired a big shot like him, but Bai clarifies that he's an instructor at Ching Hong Academy. Just then, Shun Run grows old at a rapid speed inside this domain. He asks Bai if he knows what the Lins have done to him, and Bai says he does, as it's evident in his face. He then tells Shun Run to save his breath, as he's about to die soon from old age. Bai claims that he doesn't care about the Lin family, and rightfully so, and he also sympathizes with Shun Run's tragic experience. However, he can't let him kill the entire city. The least Bai can do is to let Shun Run die with dignity. Shun Run scoffs at his pity, and he suddenly unleashes a powerful force within him. Meanwhile, Li Yu West senses the aura of the demon race coming from the domain. Shun Run suddenly transforms into a gigantic demon, immune from spiritual powers. This finally confirms Bai's suspicion that he is indeed part of the demon clan. Meanwhile, Shun Run claims that this hypocritical world should be destroyed, even if it means sacrificing himself to his lord. He finally turns into a full-on demon, and he attacks Bai Luo Chun. Knowing that spiritual powers don't work on Shun Run, Bai realizes that he can utilize pure force. He then unleashes a forceful attack, tearing his clothes in the process. Shun Run, on the other hand, gets disintegrated by the powerful punch. Bai is literally one punch man with hair. The system suddenly appears, congratulating Bai for completing the task. It tells Bai to claim his reward, but he puts that on hold because he has much greater responsibilities at the moment. Shun Run has a connection with the Soul Sect and the Demon Clan, so there should be more clues on him. Suddenly, a remnant of Shun Run's demon body attempts to escape, but Bai destroys it. At the very core of it is a mysterious treasure, and it's familiar to Bai's eyes. Meanwhile, Li Yuan noticed that the Demon Clan's aura had disappeared. Duo Duo, on the other hand, is still battling Zi Un. Zhan Nun and Lin Chun are already safe and secured within Mi Meng's moth silk, but Zi Un just won't give up. He even keeps running around, attempting to exhaust Duo Duo, rather than fight her. Meanwhile, Zi Un is shocked that the disciples are still alive, even after using the green snake's deadly poison on them. Well, if that won't work, time to unleash a super punch. Duo Duo dodges, and she retaliates with a super kick. However, Zi Un swerves the attack, witnessing that Mi Meng's demon pill enhanced Duo Duo's physical performance. Li Yue plans to try it out for herself. However, Mi Meng says she can dream. All right, insect lady, hoard the goods. Zi Un continues to run for it, planning to just escape and disappear somewhere. However, he finds himself face to face with Bai Luo Chun. What a coincidence, huh? Bai simply ends Zi Un, causing a huge explosion. After this, Bai approaches the disciples, showing them the treasure he found within Shun Run. Mi Meng has a treasure similar to it, and she found it when she was traveling in the South Sea. The people there offered sacrifices to it, suggesting that there might be an unknown power inside it. She got curious and borrowed it to play with. Bai claims that he sealed the Demon Clan's entrance in the South Sea back then, but it seems that the Soul Sect and the Demon Clan have lots of entanglements. However, Bai decides to put this issue off for another day, and they return to Qing Luan Peak. Upon arriving, 
Bai informs the disciples that he will take Duo Duo to report to the Dean and pay their respects to the Master. He also tasks Li Yue to go to the Four Arts Department and find Zi Ling, as they can't do their next mission without her. However, upon entering the Talisman Department, it finds the whole place in disarray. There is firewood everywhere, and Shi Yao Li seems preoccupied with something. Bai asks where Mon Mon is causing Shi Yao Li Yu to run into his arms, begging him for help. Zi Ling suddenly appears, notifying Bai that Mon Mon's situation is more serious than anticipated. Mon Mon's body is rejecting her soul, and only soul-binding crystals can temporarily lock her soul inside. However, it won't hold out for long. Bai asks where Zi Ling got the fuel for the soul-binding crystals, as it is known to be powered by living souls. Zi Ling replies that she replenished it with the livestock souls from the whole academy, which isn't that strong. Mon Mon is now relying on her cultivation to hold on, but if there's no crystal, her body and spirit will be destroyed. However, using up plenty of living souls is also not a feasible option. Hearing this, Shi Ya Li Yu is determined to sacrifice her soul. However, Bai stops her, reminding her that Mon Mon wouldn't be proud of what she's thinking. He then reassures her that he will take care of everything. Just then, Bai uses his powers over Mon Mon, summoning her spirit to come out. A confused blue spirit appears, and it resembles Mon Mon. Shi Yao Li Yu hypothesizes that Mon Mon transformed into her spirit form because of the serpent. Zi Ling, on the other hand, is shocked that it's possible to separate the soul from the body without harming the flesh. Bai then explains to everyone that the serpent's name is Qing Poer, and it can turn the souls it eats into its own cultivation. This also causes its spiritual power and soul to be the same, so it can basically nourish Mon Mon's soul from now on. However, it might take some time before Mon Mon can get used to it. Mon Mon, being the kind soul that she is, reassures everyone that she's doing just fine. Li Yu West suddenly asks Bai Luo Chun when Mon Mon can return to her own body. Bai explains that it's complicated. He only found out that Mon Mon's soul was separated after he rebuilt her meridians. This must mean that her soul was fused with the corpse for too long, and it was incompatible with the current body. To turn a corpse soul of an Earth immortal level into a living soul, even with Qing Poer, it will take up to a hundred years to nourish. Welp, seems like Mon Mon will be in ghost mode for quite some time. Mi Meng comments that it's not really a big deal, as long as Mon Mon is fine. Besides, cultivating immortals has no time limit. Even she had to eat leaves for decades before she became a demon. Well, what do you know? Little Moth Girl here was vegan. A hundred years is quite long. At that rate, Wu Shui would be immortal already. Bai suggests that they'd brainstorm a way to speed up the process, Zi Ling claims that there was a treasure in the Soul Palace in the Demon Realm that was related to repairing the soul, but she's not too sure if it can actually help. Of oh, the Demon Realm again? Give Bai a break. However, he knows that he has to try his luck. He then asks Duo Duo, Zi Ling, and Shi Yao Li Yu to come with him. Meanwhile, Mi Meng and Li Yu Wei will stay to look after Mon Mon. Although Mi Meng is relieved to finally have a long overdue vacation, Li Yu Wei wants to accompany Bai. Geez, woman, you gotta take a chill pill. However, Bai gives her a good girl pat on the head, reminding her that Mon Mon needs her. Left with no choice, Li Yue complies. Lol, what a simp. Before setting out for the demon realm, Duo Duo expresses her concerns about not being strong enough to aid Bai. After all, her realm is not that much. However, Bai explains to her that she's just starting out, so she should treat this as her training. Just then, Shi Yao Li Yu talks over Bai, boasting to Duo Duo that she'll take care of her. Shi Yao Li Yu also adds that 10 years ago, there was a demon who fought her and disappeared before the winner was announced. She's very determined to crack this demon's head open if ever she sees it. However, Bai reminds her that they're going to get treasures and investigate, not cause fights. While everyone is ready for this new adventure, Zi Ling is wondering why she's even part of it. She's not even from Qing Luan Peak. Just then, Bai's floating boat arrives, grabbing everyone to put them on board. They then head to the Bay Yuan Sea on the south border. Meanwhile, in the Sword Art Department's Broken Sword Cave, a mysterious man cultivates on top of a throne made of swords. That's got hurt, just then. An entity notifies him that the Demon Lord is about to revive, but he's in his cave hiding. This man is Chun Yi He, the former Sword Art Department instructor. He reminds the entity that his active sacrifice is the duty given to him by his Lord, and if necessary, he will be the sharp sword that will pierce the hearts of those in the Immortal Alliance. Just then, the entity asks, doesn't his Tushi hurt? Chun Yi replies that only he can understand this process, as it is his cultivation technique. 
Geez, these cultivation methods are weird. First, we get the stinky Dao, and now the bloody bum. Okay, maybe I made that up. Chun Yi suddenly asks the entity of his purpose for visiting him. The entity replies that the little snake, Ching Shi, exposed himself, causing some people to notice what Chun Yi has been up to. Because of this, Bai Luo Chun from the Talisman Department is headed to the Bay Yuan Sea. Chun Yi figures that Bai shouldn't be that much work, as he's known to be trash. Seemed like Bloody Bum here didn't get the memo. Meanwhile, the team arrives in Bei Yuan. Of course. For a little fan service, the disciples are wearing skimpy bikinis. Shi Yao Li Yu is complaining that the bikini is uncomfortable and has low defense. She doesn't get why Bai made them wear it because a water avoidance technique can simply solve their problem. However, Bai reminds her that the demonic energy around the Bei Yuan Sea will erode the spiritual energy. So the water avoidance technique won't work. Plus, the swimsuits are fused with dragon skin, making its defense top-notch. However, Shi Yao Li Yu only expresses her annoyance. She's even more frustrated that Bai didn't help her carry their things. Bai then reasons that he was teaching someone a lesson. Meanwhile, Zi Ling is embarrassed by what she's wearing. I don't know about you, but if I had a body that snatched, you wouldn't catch me wearing any clothes. Bai reassures Zi Ling that the bikini suits her, which makes her blush. She also believes that Bai's outfit suits him. Maybe because a specific area is bulging. Just then, Shi Yao Li Yu irritatingly calls everyone to plunge into the water. As everyone goes deeper into the water, they are unaware that a spy in a diving suit is monitoring them. The spy reports to his captain, saying that the mechanism has been set up and the moles are also ready. The entity suddenly appears, excited to witness Bai Luo Chun's impending doom. Bai Luo Chun and the girls finally arrive at a cave with a glowing seal. Bai notices that the seal is weakened. Meaning it won't hold out for long. However, he observes that the demonic energy concentration has surged to over 180 times the usual level, enough to corrupt up to 80% all spiritual energy. This might be worse than Bai initially thought. While underwater, the team is communicating using their spiritual consciousness. Shi Yao Li Yu then asks Bai how they can use the talisman beads if spiritual power can't be used. Bai turns to Zi Ling, inquiring if she learned anything about the demonic world during her time in the Soul Sect. Zi Ling responds that the demonic world seemed to be preparing for something significant, but she was too preoccupied with resurrecting the Soul Ancestor to investigate further. Suddenly, Shi Yao Li Yu realizes she can't gather any spiritual energy at all. The area is saturated with demonic energy, rendering spiritual power useless. When she last visited a thousand years ago, the ocean wasn't in such a dire state. Bai says that the ocean was only polluted with demonic energy in the last thousand years. The only effective items within the area were talismans and magic tools that had innate powers, but even those don't work now. This leaves Shi Yao Li Yu wondering what exactly happened while she was away. Bai explains that the human and demonic worlds were separated a thousand years ago. At this time, an island country opened a special rift to obtain a power that could suppress spiritual energy, and they did this despite the protests of the other countries. However, their negligence caused the spatial cracks to go rogue. Because of this, the water was filled with demonic energy, including the ocean itself. This even birthed some weird mutant monsters. Shi Yao Li Yu is enraged after hearing this, and she badly wants to beat up the people responsible for it. However, Bai tells her that she's too late because the experts have already destroyed that island country, and all that's left of it is the current Bei Yuan Ocean. When will Shi Yao Li Yu ever get to beat someone up? Just then, Bai tells everyone to put on their earpieces, as this will hurt them communicate using their spiritual conscience without being weakened by the demonic energy. Cool, ancient spy earpieces. Before proceeding with the mission, Bai explains that they have to remove the four restrictions and open the passage. He then sends the girls to their respective seals, as each has to put a talisman bead inside. After completing this, they are to report to Bai. Moments later, Bai reports to everyone that he has placed his bead talisman. Shi Yao Li Yu and Duo Duo notify Bai that they're done. However, as Zi Ling reports that she has completed her task, a giant tentacle suddenly grabs her. I see where this can go, if you know what I mean. Meanwhile, Bai gets alarmed upon hearing Zi Ling scream. Suddenly, Shi Yao Li Yu and Duo Duo are attacked as well. Of course, one tentacle is wrapped around Duo Duo's left melon. Bai quickly tries saving them, but he comes face to face with the Castanea larva a gigantic sea monster in the tribulation stage. Aside from encountering something that's the size of a building, Bai is also quite concerned that a monster of this stage exists in the area. With no other choice, he uses a risky technique. 
Meanwhile, Xiao Li Yu struggles to set herself free from the monster's grasp. It's absorbing her spiritual power, so she urges Bai to help them before she gets sucked dry. Meanwhile, Bai uses the space creation technique to save Zi Ling and Duo Duo. Okay, but how about Xiao Li Yu? Bai thinks she should set herself free because she's a demon ancestor anyway. Enraged, Xiao Li Yu proves her capabilities in this dire situation. She's been staying under Bai's wing for too long that she's forgotten her true form. Time for a little reunion with her inner demon. Xiao Li Yu suddenly gathers all her remaining powers, unleashing a Mirit Pestle attack on the monster. However, the monster still puts up a fight, but this seems fun for our little demon bunny. As Xiao Li Yu keeps herself occupied, Bai urges the girls to help him stabilize the portal. As all this chaos ensues, the entity and the spy observe the team. The spy addresses the entity as Lord Envoy, and he asks if they have any plans of reporting this incident to the Ocean Lord. However, the Lord Envoy replies that the sea monster is merely a scout, and reporting the issue is not necessary. He also adds that it's only a matter of time until the Ocean Lord's power descends on them all. And when this happens, Bai and his team will be nothing but fish food. Meanwhile, the monster finally reveals its true form to Xiao Li Yu. She gets hyped up as she channels her inner demon, causing her clothes to tear in the process. Just then, Xiao Li Yu reveals her colossal demon form, which for some reason, upgraded her melons as well. The battle escalates above the ocean as two demons prepare for a deadly showdown. Stating that the situation has escalated, the spy expresses his concerns to the Lord and Voy, but the latter shuts him up, saying that he can see what's happening. He stresses that they must not allow Xiao Li Yu to pass through the portal, as the demon lord is testing them. He then commands the spy to reach out to Chun Yi, desperate to ensure that they complete the demon lord's great cause. It doesn't take long for Chun Yi to receive the envoy's signal. With this, he commands his men to prepare to launch the East Wind Sword. Upon receiving the coordinates, Chun Yi and his men release a giant sword into the sky. Cool. A sword that functions as a missile. As the sword ascends, Chun Yi wishes for the envoy's soul to rest in peace. Well, meanwhile, Bai urges Xiao Li Yu to end the monster because the portal has almost stabilized. In the demonic world, the head maid of a mansion notices that it's about to rain. Back in Bei Yuan, the sword finally appears, and it causes a powerful nuclear explosion. Before embracing his demise, the Lord Envoy screams that this is all for the demon Lord, who probably doesn't even know him. In the middle of the void, Bai notices that his shield strength is rapidly decreasing. Because of this, he urgently commands the system to change its route, directing it to the demon world. Bai is also bewildered that Dong Feng, the Immortal Alliance's treasure sword, appeared in Bei Yuan. This only implies that someone is allying with the demon world. However, Bai puts this hypothesis on hold and prioritizes escaping before the spiritual energy gets eroded. Just then, Bai and the girls are contained in a portal, but the system informs him that the landing point is not quite specific. Meanwhile, Duo Duo panics when she loses sight of Bai, but his puppet appears beside her, revealing they're headed for the demon realm. There's a chance they'll get separated during teleportation, so she must ensure her safety until they regroup. Zi Ling, on the other hand, is worried that she might die young because of this mission. Meanwhile, Xiao Li Yu is back in her normal cute state, but she's still acting feral with the monster's amputated tentacles. Finally, the team enters the demon world. Before they get separated, he reminds everyone to stay safe and ensure their safety. Later on, Bai lands in Mushi, a town in the demon world. He asks the system to disguise his appearance, but it informs him that his spiritual energy is insufficient. His ability to communicate with the team is also hindered due to this, but he's reassured by the fact that the girls have a 99.999% survival rate, thanks to the puppets. This makes Bai worried for himself, as he doesn't have a puppet. Just then, the system converts Bai's spiritual energy into a demonic one. Sure, he looks like a unicorn with a horn on his forehead, but at least he's blending in. However, judging by the sight of his horn, he must be average. After this, the system loads a demon language module, granting Bai comprehension of the local tongue. Suddenly, he overhears a soldier report to his boss that a laborer has gone missing. He gets reprimanded for his incompetence, then he quickly sets out to find the missing person. The soldier worries that he might have to find a replacement for the laborer, but the strong laborers in the village are drafted into the military. Just how can he find a substitute now? Bai, my man, it's your time to shine. Bai approaches the soldier, asking if they're hiring. However, the soldier notices that he looks rather rich to become a worker. 
He even suspects that Bai is part of the Feather Clan Young Master, and he only ran away to experience life and boast about his wealth. Well, seems like his little horn was too subtle. Despite this, Bai gets hired and receives an instruction to enter a carriage. While he sits and waits, he can't help but worry about the girls. However, he's reassured by the fact that the puppets can assist them. Just then, David, a newbie, strikes up a conversation with Bai, asking why he looks sick. Bai introduces himself, and he replies that he's just preoccupied with something. David thinks his name sounds foreign. So Bai makes up a lie, suggesting that he's from the East. Bai then asks why there's an urgent need to find workers, leaving David stunned that he doesn't even know what he signed up for. David goes on to explain that they're working for the noble lord, but they are treated harshly because they're white demons. Indeed, there's racial discrimination here, but with a major plot twist. This information shocks Bai, but he covers his naive with a lie, saying that in the East, their statuses are based on strength, not skin color. Realizing that Bai is not well-oriented about the town's customs and traditions, David gives him a crash course. He explains that there are two major races in their realm, the black goat race and the white demons. While the latter has a low affinity for magic, the black goats are known masters of magic. These people made significant achievements in the last war, which enabled them to become nobles. Although the majority of the population is composed of white demons, they are born as lowly. And you know what that means. Their lives are useless in the eyes of the elite. Harsh, huh? It seems like people like David are destined for doom. But why does he look excited to work for the noble lord? Bai asks why, and David replies that he's doing it for love. Say what now? He elaborates that the young lady of Wilton Duke's house smiled at him once, and since then, he vowed to win her heart. Wow, this man is delusional. Bai thinks so too, and he even comments that being killed seems far more likely than achieving romantic reciprocation. Noticing Bai's bitter remark, David reassures him that he'll find a lover of his own, one that won't judge the size of his horn. Cheese, size does matter. Bai doesn't know what he means by this, but he's surely offended. Later on, the two finally arrive at Wilton Mansion. However, Bai is so starstruck by the mansion that he doesn't notice he's being called to report. The officer in charge suddenly attempts to whip him, but Bai catches it with just one hand. Surprised by the strength of this lowly white demon, the officer politely tells Bai that he'll get fired if he doesn't comply. With this, Bai joins David in a hall where workers are assessed for their magical abilities. If they perform well, they might even get to work in the inner courtyard of the mansion. The man in charge of assessing their skills is Gladiate, a steward from the mansion, and he informs everyone that only level 7 and above are qualified to work in the house. However, at the back of the Gladiate's head, he can't help but think that these applicants are low in quality. Meanwhile, Bai asks about how magic levels work. David explains that white demons can master magic and become chaos demons or low demons. However, this is the limit of their rank, as only black demons can receive the superior levels. In the middle of David's blabbing, Bai suddenly walks towards Glady to introduce himself. Before demonstrating his abilities, Bai reminds himself of the need to control his powers since he's pretending to be a white demon. However, just as he's about to showcase his skills, Glady assigns him the role of a laborer. Bai is infuriated feeling robbed of the chance to prove himself. Gladiate adds insult to injury by belittling Bai, suggesting that his hands will only soil the magic crystal stone. Despite attempts by a worker demon to take Bai away, he remains defiant. Suddenly, Bai touches the stone, stunning everyone as it illuminates the room. Gladiate is stunned by Bai's power, but he suddenly swats his hand away from the stone. Bai panics, and he thinks about eliminating everyone in the room before his identity gets revealed. However, these are ordinary people, and he can't bring himself to kill such innocent lives. Just then, Gladiate belittles Bai again, letting him know that he's pretentious for thinking that he has a great elemental affinity when his horn is so tiny. He then sends Bai to the labor group, believing that trash should stick with his kind. Taft, if only Bai were undercover, this man would be dead meat. Bai joins the laborer group, and he receives a mix of reactions. Some are reassuring him that being small isn't that bad, while others are making fun of him. Unlike a real schlong, you can't really hide your horn under your pants. Poor Bai. He then promises himself that he will soon make that man pay for humiliating him. Shortly after, David tries his luck with the magic stone. Gladia is impressed, seeing that he's at level 15, an intermediate chaos demon. He goes on to praise David and the other young demons, reminding them to work hard even though they are born with a low status. However, behind this man's flowery words, he's actually threatened by David. If this young demon overpowers him, 
he might just go for the kill before he watches him excel in life. Gladiot then offers David to work in the inner house, which the young demon accepts. While observing them, Bai can't help but notice that Gladiot's overly nice exterior is suspicious. He's definitely out to mess with David. In his attempt to reveal Gladiot's true intentions, Bai offers to re his fortune. However, this only offends Gladiot, so he orders his worker, away, to send Bai away. The worker is aware of Bai's potential, so he tells him not to hurt his face because he hasn't even married yet. Later that day, Bai and the other laborers are instructed to work in the back mountain. Their task is to chop 500 pieces of firewood before nightfall. And if they fail, they won't be able to sleep or eat. Oh, please. Chopping firewood is Bai's talent. Although this seems easy for Bai, the other laborers plead with Glady to show mercy, as they haven't eaten before arriving. However, this infuriates Gladiot, screaming that the master needs the firewood for his warm bath. He then threatens the laborers that he'll use them as firewood if they don't work. Sheesh. Calm down. Old man. Bai is enraged by Gladiot's cruelty. He then walks towards him with his axe, ready to chop this man in half. However, Su Fang Wei La, the manor's headmaid, informs the men that the firewood quota has been filled, and there is no need to overharvest. Wei La adds that the maid team will supervise the laborers from now on, and they will become part of the labor department. Gladiot argues that the laborers must be treated with an iron fist, or they won't be obedient to their future masters. He even justifies that he's teaching them some rules for her. However, Wei La bluntly tells this dwarf that the labor department's affairs are not his concern. Burn. Embarrassed, Gladiot leads the laborers to Wei La, and he offers to return to deal with the affairs of the inner house. Wei La rejects his offer, telling him that it's not necessary. This leaves Gladiot furious, as Wei La always stands with the lowly. As the maids start to register the laborers into the labor department, Bai asks one of them who that red-haired woman is. He discovers that her name is Wei La, the maid chief who's known for her kindness. Bai reckons he can casually talk to her, so he calls her Su Fang. He then asks if they should still chop wood because he'll volunteer for the task himself. However, Wei La tells him to address her formally, and she also informs him that they weren't supposed to chop ordinary wood, but the demon vine. The young lady of the mansion hunted this down herself, and it would promise about a thousand pieces of firewood. Seeing that this was their supposed task, the laborers were horrified. Just how can they chop that thing down with a mere axe? Out of nowhere, Bai effortlessly chops down the demon vine. Tsk, show off. Wei La is impressed, saying she's been dealing with this burden for a long time. Bai is happy to help, but he's also doing it for himself, as he has a firewood counter, and he's hoping to earn a spirit. Just then, Bai challenges Wei La on who could chop more firewood. Wei La doesn't back down on this challenge, so she and Bai immediately chop down the vine demon like crazy. Soon enough, the place is filled with stacks of firewood, and the winner is about to be announced. Bai confidently states he chopped 501 pieces, but Wei La surprises him by breaking his axe and revealing its handle is made of demon vine, bringing her total to 502. With a competitive grin, she asserts her victory and reminds Bai to address her as Wei La, the maid chief. Jeez, this woman is so competitive. Realizing that the laborers are staring at her, she screams at them to eat in the cafeteria. Bai's recent experiences leave him worried about the girls, especially Duo Duo, since her realm is not as developed as the others. Unbeknownst to him, Duo Duo is facing a ferocious monster somewhere. Duo Duo finds herself struggling against this mighty monster, her spiritual power being down at 70%. The virtual guide suggests that she uses an item for self-preservation, but she refuses, claiming that she came to train and she's not a delicate porcelain doll. However, she soon realizes that she can no longer fight with magic, as her spiritual energy is not enough. Left with no choice, she musters all her courage to execute a special attack. Chi Mun. Upon uttering this word, a huge explosion occurs, fatally injuring the monster. Duo Duo then commands the guy to reverse the universe, transforming her into a demon. This also increases her spiritual power to 100%, and it also equips her with divine powers without being vulnerable to demonic elements. With her Tai Yin entangling silk rope, Duo Duo finishes up the monster by chopping it to pieces. Realizing that the attack she pulled just saved her life, Duo Duo can't help but be relieved that Mon Mon taught her the Chi Mun technique before her departure. She remembers Mon Mon telling her that only a few can use the technique without suffering side effects. It seems like she's one of the lucky ones. Although the Chi Mun technique seems useful, users can only use it once every 10 days. Duo Duo then commands the guide to give her a spirit awakening talisman, 
but it doesn't comply due to an unknown error. This makes Duo Duo worry because if another monster appears, she will definitely be dead. She can't be that unlucky, right? Wrong. Another monster suddenly appears behind her, attacking without notice. Luckily, she's able to teleport, leaving her clothes to be chomped up by the monster. However, it doesn't take long for the monster to catch on, quickly tracking down Duo Duo's hiding spot. Amid her impending doom, an upper-ranked demon named Sheikha observes her. Meanwhile, Duo Duo fights the monster with a Suan Yin absolute skin. However, she can't hold this form for long, so she demands a spirit awakening talisman from the guide. Unfortunately, the mode switching is still in progress. Just then, the monster attacks, but it bites on Duo Duo's poison wings. Enraged, the monster fires a strong beam of fire towards Duo Duo that could have killed her, but Bai's puppet saves her just in time. She then realizes that the monster's upper body has exploded from the incident. Suddenly, Sheikha approaches Duo Duo, addressing her as a companion. She goes on to compliment Duo Duo for her bravery, and she claims that she's truly Shaja's companion. Confused, Duo Duo asks what this means. So Sheikha explains that anyone aiding Sha Jia in the fight against the GU's people is considered a true companion. Duo Duo reflects on this revelation, considering that the seal worn by the monster likely indicates its connection to the GU's people. Sheikha then shares that one of her family members fell victim to the dragon puppet, the same creature Duo Duo defeated. This is why she's grateful, as Duo Duo has contributed to avenging her loss. Just then, Sheikha notices their matching purple wings, leading her to speculate that they may be related. What's up with this woman? And why is she so eager to befriend Duo Duo? Despite her thoughts, Duo Duo maintains her innocent facade and politely asks Sheikha if she can assist her in reaching the nearest city. Sheikha responds affirmatively, offering to escort her to Shaja's capital, Shaja City. Before they depart, Sheikha introduces herself while Duo Duo opts to go by the alias son Duo Duo, a precaution to ensure her safety. Later on, the two arrive at Shaja City, which is built within a tunnel. Just then, Sheikha gets greeted by an injured boy named Aisha, and he's asking if she found his parents. However, Sheikha regrets to inform him that they are in now paradise, reciting scriptures to God. The young boy is reassured by this information, and he's comforted further upon receiving a book that his parents supposedly gave him. As Sheikha departs with Duo Duo, the latter asks if the boy's parents are dead. Sheikha confirms this, saying that the GU's clan, the puppeteers that control the dragon puppets, are responsible for it. Just then, a demon rushes to inform Sheikha that a puppeteer has regained consciousness. Sheikha swiftly heads to the scene with Duo Duo in tow, where they find the puppeteer badly injured and covered in blood. Assuming the demon is now willing to cooperate, Sheikha demands to know their mission and the number of GU's people deployed. However, the puppeteer remains defiant and insults her instead. In response, Sheikha delivers a powerful slap to the puppeteer's face, causing his eyeball to dangle out. Whoa! Someone signed this woman up for a slapping contest. Nevertheless, the puppeteer claims that he doesn't care about dying because he's a noble GU's warrior. He then reveals that their mission is to free the promised land of Sheikha's kind, eliminating all of them. The puppeteer starts laughing uncontrollably, so Sheikha punches him to death. Wow, the gore in this arc is crazy. Sheikha apologizes to Duo Duo for seeing her nasty side, but the latter reassures her that it's alright. Sheikha goes on to explain that Sha Jia is currently at war, so she can't leave for a while. She then offers Duo Duo to stay at her place in the meantime. Duo Duo accepts, but she can't help but think about how much trouble she's in right now. Meanwhile, on Fallon Island, Xia Liu does what she does best, picking a fight with a monster. She battles a ferocious tentacled beast, but it won't surrender no matter what. Just then, Xia Liu's spiritual power converts, allowing her to upgrade her abilities. She uses this to her advantage, allowing her to force the monster into submission. The monster reverts to its docile form, and it cries in defeat. Just then, a group of natives sense a magic essence coming from Xia Liu. They eventually locate where the essence is coming from, and they're quite shocked by what they see. Lin Merlin, the leader of the Klein Church, is ecstatic upon realizing that they have found Kanara, a legendary ancient deity. Kanara who? Well, according to Merlin, the tentacled monster is believed to be a deity of some sort. Using her magic, she summons the monster into her grasp, and with her followers, they happily celebrate their monumental discovery. They might seem overjoyed, 
but Shi Yao Li can't help but think they're a bunch of loonies. Merlin starts cuddling the monster, calling her Nana. Just then, the group catches sight of Shi Yao Li Yu, and they notice that she looks familiar. Merlin is shocked, and she immediately uses her super speed to appear behind Shi Yao Li Yu. With a grin on her face, Merlin states that Shi Yao Li Yu must be Lord Kanara's sister, Lu Lu. Just what is this crazy woman talking about? Shi Yao Li Yu frees herself from Merlin's grasp, but when she doesn't budge, Shi Yao Li Yu sends her flying into the air with one good punch. Upon landing, Merlin giggles in excitement, claiming that Shi Yao Li Yu likes her because she was blessed by her touch. Just then, one of the natives notices that the presumed Lady Nana doesn't like Shi Yao Li Yu. However, Merlin says that won't make sense, as the two obviously look like sisters. Meanwhile, Shi Yao Li Yu assesses the situation and devises a plan to turn it to her advantage. Realizing that the natives don't understand the language of the little goblin, she decides to fabricate a story. Seizing the opportunity, Shi Yao Li Yu grabs Nana, claiming that the deity is hungry and demands food. The natives are relieved to finally comprehend Nana's intentions, and they finally believe that the two are indeed sisters. Shi Yao Li Yu then threatens Nana, telling her that the natives don't understand her so she must behave. Shi Yao Li Yu, you evil rabbit. Later on, Shi Yao Li Yu and Nana arrive at the Klein Church, where a huge feast awaits them. Shi Yao Li Yu is dazed to see a temple inside a cave because it really gives her the full experience. Just then, Merlin expresses her joy that the two have finally descended on her side after waiting for thousands of years. She then informs them that she has prepared a gift, and she hopes that it is to their liking. Suddenly, a native announces the arrival of the gift. A statue of Lord Kanara. Um, this doesn't look like her at all. If anything, it looks disabled. Offended, Shi Yao Li Yu asks how she resembles Nana if she looks like that. And Merlin comes up with the dumbest reply. They both don't have melons. Say what? They're relying on bedonkers to recognize people. Shi Yao Li Yu is on the verge of biting Merlin's head off, but manages to calm herself, realizing that having Nana by her side offers a sense of security. Just then, the head chef informs Merlin that the great wealth is ready. Merlin then notifies the so-called sisters of this, but before they can proceed with the feast, they must first perform a ceremony initiated by Nana. Merlin instructs Shi Yao Li Yu to come close to a box with sharp teeth. Suddenly, a huge tongue emerges from the box and swallows Nana, which shocks Shi Yao Li Yu. She then headlocks Merlin, demanding her to return her little goblin sister. However, Merlin reassures her that Boxy won't hurt Nana. True enough, Nana emerges from the box with a new set of clothes. Nana poses for the crowd, leaving everyone starstruck. Wow, this little monster is getting used to the spotlight. With this, the feast finally commences. In the middle of the celebration, a scholar informs Merlin that they are ready to execute their plan. The cannon from the Dissension Division is also prepared, and they're only waiting for Merlin's command. Upon receiving this information, Merlin tells the scholar that they spread the gospel to the world after the feast. In an experiment field in the Holy Demon Empire's border, a red rock giant sandworm emerges from the ground. A robot suddenly attacks it with a laser beam, obtaining the magic crystal from inside it. Inside one of these robots is Doug, a senior magical puppet pilot. She complains about being tired, as this is already their 13th sandworm. They have been fighting for five days straight and haven't resupplied once. However, her co-pilot, Kate, tells her to shut her hole and quit complaining. The military has been diverting resources to airships and magic prison warheads, and if they don't work with all their might, their magical puppet warrior plan will be shelved. Suddenly, the magical puppet leader, Rokoko, informs the girls that they are about to stand on equal footing with their competitors, but they have to be resilient. As long as they verify the energy conversion efficiency of the magic crystals they collected, the magical puppets will be able to demonstrate their practical combat skills. They're also trying to test the limit of their power supply, so they must wait a few more days before returning home. By then, they will receive the resources to overcome the final spell barrier. Suddenly, Doug notices a surge of magical essence in the area. She's concerned, as there are no other magical creatures in the desert aside from the sandworms. Kate agrees it is strange because the experimental zone is known to be a death zone. Just then, the sky grows dark, indicating a sandstorm. Doug and Kate suggest they shouldn't go deeper, but Rokoko argues that their project has been on hold for too long. This experiment also exhausted all her resources, so there's no turning back now. This might just lead them to the Mighty Rock Emperor Worm, the objective of their mission. Loyal to their leader, Doug and Kate follow her into the sandstorm. However, they find their path blocked by a huge shadow. 
Doug and Kate are alarmed, but Rokoko reassures them that it's merely a mirage. Unbeknownst to the pilots, a shadow is Bai's gigantic puppet, with Zi Ling resting on its shoulder. Upon her arrival, she was relentlessly attacked by monsters. She tried fighting them, but she was unable to use her magical powers. Thanks to Bai's puppet, she's safe from being a sandworm snack, but they're now trapped in the desert. Just then, a laser beam fires at Bai's puppet, causing it to defend itself. One of the pilots claimed that something took a hit from their 120mm magic beam cannon, but it received no damage. Rokoko commands the pilots to fire another shot, as she senses that something is off. Suddenly, Doug notifies Rokoko that someone is resting on the puppet's shoulder. Meanwhile, Zi Ling screams at the pilots not to hit her, claiming she's a law-abiding citizen. However, Rokoko only sees Bai's puppet as a threat, so she fires another shot. She then tells the pilots that Zi Ling is a white devil, and that she might be part of the Rebel Alliance's Dagao project. Rokoko soon realizes that the laser beams are not causing any damage, so she instructs Dung and Kate to engage in close combat. Meanwhile, Zi Ling nestles safely in Bai's chest. Just then, the pilots rain physical attacks on Bai's puppet, but their robots are mercilessly destroyed in the process. Rokoko is defeated. If this puppet is truly working for the Rebel Alliance's Da Gao, then the death of her father will be all for nothing. Consumed by rage, she vows to take Bai's puppet down, even if it means her death. Rokoko fires a strong laser beam towards the puppet, but it remains unscathed. Meanwhile, Zi Ling is impressed by the pilot's strength as they manage to tear off the puppet's sleeves. Unfortunately for Rokoko, her recent attack ultimately caused her demise. As the storm subsides, the cockpit of the robot opens, unveiling Rokoko's lifeless and withered form. Zi Ling reckons that it has been long since Rokoko's death, so its soul is still fresh. She then peers into Rokoko's soul and takes over her body, vowing to accomplish the poor demon's unfulfilled dreams. Seem like someone gets an end pass now. Her next destination? The Imperial Capital. Back at Wilton Mansion. Bai has become quite the nuisance for Wei La. He's chopped an excessive amount of firewood, enough to last an entire year. Not only that, he somehow managed to domesticate a rock monster to construct houses, participated in the maid organization's fishing activity by catching a giant whale, and engaged in reckless behavior such as row housing with pets and even committing arson. What a mess! Wei La suddenly bounces into consciousness. Phew, false alarm, it was just a dream, people. Despite that, Wei La is still annoyed that Bai is still bothering her even in her sleep. Although he's quite the headache, she won't let him get in the way of her work. She quickly gets dressed and prepares to tackle the tasks of the day. After this, Wei La checks on Bai to see what he's up to. Unbeknownst to her, our beloved MC is feeling sick. Meanwhile, Bai reads the morning paper. He discovers that Shai Ka, the leader of the terrorist organization Sharjah Wing, has been killed by the GUs. However, he doubts this news because this Shai Ka person has already been killed three times that week. Another section of the paper talks about the Imperial Puppet Project's attempt at reclaiming the human realm. Meanwhile, strange sightings of a sculpture related to the Nei cult have been appearing in various locations of the Empire. Furthermore, Sunfront City also announces its plans to rid the city of beggars. Upon finishing the morning paper, Bai can't help but realize that even the demon world is in disarray. Oh, Bai. If only you knew your disciples are the ring leaders. As Wei La enters her office, she is met with the sight of Bai lounging around and casually sipping tea. Kreezen, the house cat, scurries away as he senses trouble. Wei La is enraged by Bai's lack of productivity, so she grabs him by the ear and demands an explanation for his laziness. Bai defends himself by claiming he has already completed his tasks and is simply using her lounge because it's available. Wei La retorts that she ends up cleaning up after Bai finishes his tasks and he has no right to talk back. Bai, however, counters by suggesting it's not his fault she can't keep pace with him. Woo, bars. Wei La is on the verge of striking Bai, but he stops her hand, urging her to refrain from violence when she's losing an argument. Realizing that Bai finds his tasks too easy, Wei La devises a plan to teach him a lesson. She instructs her maid, Funa, to fetch the largest uniform in the mansion, intending to officially enlist Bai into the maid course. Although Bai is willing to work, he is less than thrilled about wearing a maid uniform. Wei La insists he must comply with the strict dress code and reminds him he's only a trainee who must pass all the trials. Wei La reminds Bai that he should be grateful, as lowly small horned white mages like him don't even have the opportunity to participate in trials. In response, Bai directs Wei La's attention to her own horns while she critiques his. 
He reveals that people gossip behind Wei La's back, mocking her as little horns. Adding insult to injury, Bai declares his refusal to partake in any trials. Oh, this guy is testing her. Sensing that a war is about to ensue, Funa excuses herself from the room. Wei La offers Bai one last chance to apologize and comply with wearing the uniform, but he remains defiant. Despite sensing her anger, Bai reminds himself to uphold his gentlemanly demeanor and refrain from fighting back. He decides to leave, prompting Wei La to spring into action, determined to force Bai into wearing the uniform. However, before she can lay a hand on him, Bai places a purifying charm on Wei La's forehead, effectively calming her down. Finally, some peace and quiet. Bai attempts to lay her down to sleep, but out of nowhere, Wei La breaks free from the spell. She is now consumed by rage, knowing that Bai is challenging her authority with a measly piece of paper. Meanwhile, at the estate farm, two maids find themselves struggling to bring down an earth dragon for dinner. Panic sets in as they fear they might end up as the beast's meal instead. Just as the situation reaches its peak, the beast is suddenly cleaved in half, revealing Bai as the unlikely hero. And yes, he's wearing the maid uniform. Later on, Bai helps the other maids in preparing the earth dragon. As they pull a wagon filled with meat, the maid asks if he's one of them now. Bai explains that he lost a match against Wei La as he didn't expect her to be that strong. One of the maids expresses how unlikely the situation is because it's the first time that a man has joined the team. The maid team was originally the estate's soldier team. However, since Wei La became the head maid, the assessment was impossible to pass. Male mages couldn't even get through the initial stages. Hearing this makes Bai realize that the demon realm is a female-dominated world. No wonder Wei La was like a buff wrestler. Finally, Bai and the maids arrive at Sunrik's house, and they immediately protect themselves with armor before entering. Bai sees no need for it, as he believes they're a hassle. Hearing this, the maid reminds Bai to be careful because three maids have already been injured in the past month. Bai reassures them that he'll be fine, claiming that he's good with pets. Upon entering, Bai encounters Sunrik, a demon pet. I don't know what to feel about this animal. It's like a mix of everything. Bai is unfazed, and he lifts Sunrik by his horn, prompting the maids to warn him of its unpredictable nature. True enough, the demon dog spits fire on Bai Luo Chun's face. When the fire dies out, the maids call out for Bai, worried that he might have been disintegrated. Out of nowhere, Bai's hand emerges from the ground, punching Sunrik in the face. This goblin won't be spitting fire for a while. Impressed by Bai's abilities, the maids express gratitude, acknowledging his help and sparing them from additional work. Bai replies that it's nothing to fuss about as the maid team must be dealing with monsters on the daily. The maids clarify that this is the special task force's job. The maid team doesn't even have to fight monsters while the special task force is away because Wei La does this for them. One of the maids shares that the special task force is exploring a special type of magic crystal in the depths of the Abyss mine, which has a lot of monsters and traps. Hearing people talk highly about Wei La, Bai finally understands why David has fallen for her. After their little talk, the three leave Sunrik's food and call it a day. That night, David gets assisted by his fellow laborers because he's too weak to bring himself home. Glady keeps giving him a hard time and he's not letting him rest. Bai suddenly wakes up, seeing the beat up David lying beside him. David then cracks a joke, telling Bai that he's getting married soon because he saw the young lady Wing was about to leave for the Abyss Mine. Bai can only sigh at David's situation as he heals him. This leaves Bai reflecting on what has been happening in the demon realm lately. Sharja, the puppets, and the magic crystals are being pursued by the owner of the estate. At first, Bai only wanted information about the soul sect, but he's afraid that it's becoming much more complex than that. He then tries asking the system for assistance, but to no avail. Left with no choice, Bai summons the devilish muscleman to ask for help. Unbeknownst to him, a mysterious maid has discovered that Bai can use talismans. In the back mountains, a maid gets chased by a rogue demon vine. She almost ends up dead if it weren't for Bai who happens to be in the area. He asks the maid why she came to the back mountains, and she replies that she wants to discuss something with Bai Luo Chun, unaware she is already speaking to him. Bai notices that this maid is a bit clumsy, so she couldn't be from Wei La's side. The maid says that Wei La also oversees the domestic affairs of the estate, and this said department has a big task for Bai. Bai reluctantly agrees to go with her, but she must first tell him where they're going and what he's supposed to do. The maid informs him that there is a carriage down the mountain. He is to get on it, blindfold himself, and wait three hours until his arrival. She will then tell him what to do when they get there. Him, a little sketchy, right? Well, 
Not for Bai, because he just agreed to all that. As Bai and the maid leave, the demon observes them in the shadows. As expected, that maid is a puppeteer, and the first phase is complete. Thanks, sir. The demon then instructs the maid beside her to prepare their comrades at the mine. If they succeed, Bai Luo Chun might just become their strongest asset. The maid beside the demon turns out to be one of those who work under Wei La. What a traitor. She's quite worried that the puppeteer might blow their cover because she failed to pass the infiltration training. However, the demon believes that men always fall for clumsy and innocent girls. Bai Luo Chun is totally buying the puppeteer's act. Curious. The maid asks where the demon learned about men's preferences. The demon replies that's from a popular newspaper novel titled The Dominant Demon Lord Falls in Love With Me. Wow, that's so reliable. 